continuing with our series entitled The Danger of Disqualification and how to avoid it in our lives. We're all running a race. I don't know, how did you run your race last week? Are you challenged by what the race holds this week? Are you aware of what's coming? And so often, we're not always fully aware of what's coming, and we, yet we've got to run it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. The prize doesn't just fall into our laps. The prize is given as an award to us for running our race well. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So Paul had a fear in his heart that he would make all this effort, run his race every day, only that at the end of his race to be told, you're disqualified. You did something in your race that you should not have done. And because of that, you cannot receive your prize. And so Paul identifies that his biggest challenge wasn't people around him, but that his biggest challenge was, his, was himself. And so this evening I'm going to share with you something that I, I wish the entire congregation was here tonight. I'm going to send the link out because I'm going to speak about something that you and I are challenged with every day. And if we can identify this tonight and avoid it in our lives or conquer it or master it, we will avoid disqualification. If we look at the word disqualification again, it is a fact that disqualifies someone from a position or activity. Have you ever been in a position and suddenly you were taken out of that position and you lost that position and you were disqualified for being in that position because you did something that you should not have done. You were involved in an activity and because you said something you shouldn't have said, before you know it, you lost your part in it and it was removed out of your life and you were disqualified from being part of it again. The word disqualification also means the act of stopping someone from taking part in a competition or activity, usually because a rule has been broken. How many of you have ever broken a rule? Don't look all so holy. Come on, we've all broken a rule from time to time where we just haven't done what was required of us. Who's been sent to the naughty corner? Can you remember those days? Oh, pastor, it still happens. My wife puts me there still every day. Sends me to the naughty corner. Well, sir, you shouldn't be naughty. And how many of us so often finds ourselves in the naughty corner of life? We were out of step at work. Our boss called us in and said, to the naughty corner. Parents got hold of us and said, to the naughty corner. Does the naughty corner exist for Christians? Well, we're going to understand this evening that the naughty corner does exist for Christians. If we turn to the Bible together in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we're going to pick it up from verse 16. And I want us to listen to the story. After Uzziah became powerful, I want you to understand this. After he became powerful. Everyone say after. You see, before he became powerful, he was still humble. It's funny how everything changes when we have power in our lives. Suddenly we are in a position that we were never in before. And suddenly because of that position, our outlook changes. And the Bible says, after Uzziah became powerful, something happened. The Bible says, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God. And entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. It wasn't his role. It wasn't his responsibility. No matter how powerful he had become, he had no right to enter the temple to light the incense. That role was up to the priests, not up to him. And so often in life when we suddenly reach a place of position or of power, or we've achieved certain things, we for some reason believe we have the right to do anything we want and whenever and however. Because do you know who I am? <laughs> Verse 19. 
while he was raging at the priest, because while the priests came in to the temple and said, excuse me, Isaiah, yes, you might have become powerful, and yes, you've got a title to your name, but what you're doing is incorrect. You should not be in the temple lighting the incense. And so Isaiah became angry in verse 19. He says, while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. And he lived in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. That's the NIV version. But in the international version, it says in verse 21, King Uzziah remained a leper until the day he died. Because he was a leper, he lived in a separate residence and remained disqualified to enter the Lord's temple. Isaiah, you may never enter the temple again because you allowed pride to rise up within you and you thought to yourself, do you know who I am? And because of that, leprosy broke out upon him. And because of leprosy breaking out, that skin disease would separate him from the temple. I have seen people, as pride enters their heart, they start to not just lose their position or lose their title, but they will even be separated from people that they hold dear. I've seen relationships get destroyed when one individual says to the other, do you know who I am? And because of pride, pride led to his downfall. And because of pride, he was disqualified and he was banned to that house of separation for the rest of his life. Disqualified to do anything else because he allowed pride into his life. Bump someone next to you quickly and with a smile and say, excuse me now, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Be nice to me, I make your sandwiches. I know what I can put on those sandwiches, eh? Be nice to me. <laughs> Let's go to another story in the book of Daniel chapter 4 and verse 29. In, in, in Daniel chapter 4, we, we come across a king, King Nebuchadnezzar. He had a dream that he couldn't understand the dream. So the man of God, Daniel, was called in to give him the interpretation of the dream. And, and Daniel gives him the interpretation. It wasn't a great interpretation. It was an interpretation that merely said... King Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to allow pride into your life. And because of that, you're going to become like a wild animal. You're no longer going to have a, ma a brain of a human. In actual fact, your brain is going to change and become that of an animal. And you're going to live like an animal for seven years. But there is a way out. If you would just honor God as sovereign and make sure that He is number one in your life and that you are not your number one, but He is your number one, then this will not come upon you. Funny how you can be warned, I can be warned, but then time goes by and we forget about the warning. And the Bible says 12 months later, verse 29, 12 months later, after being warned of what was coming His way, it says in Daniel chapter 4 verse 29, As the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this great Babylon I have built, I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. Excuse me king, did you pick up every brick? Did you plaster every wall? Did you put every light fitting in? You had a lot of people doing your job for you, and yet you take all the credit for yourself. Look what I have. Do you know who I am? Verse 31. Even as the words were still on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken away from you. Let me tell you, pride never pays off. Pride and arrogance will only cause loss and suffering. What we need today is humble hearts. Humble hearts in the home, humble hearts in the church, humble hearts in the workplace. Because God knows how to humble the pride in heart. Verse 32. 
You will be driven away from the people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times, meaning seven years will pass by for you until, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone He wishes. Until you honor God as number one in your life. You've been disqualified for seven years. You're going to act like a wild animal. <laughs> Verse 33. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away. See what pride does. Pride will drive you away. Pride will banish you. It will separate you. It will cause you now to suffer loss. As soon as the I in me raises its head, my marriage is at stake. As soon as the I in me raises its head at work, my job is at stake. As soon as the I in me raises its head and says, excuse me, do you know who I am? We're about to be disqualified for the prize in our race. Turn to someone and lovingly smile and say, he's speaking to you. Got a good feeling about this. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like the ox. Can you imagine eating grass for seven years? It's very easy when you're eating grass for seven years to blame the devil. Let me tell you, the devil had no play in that. God said it and it happened. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. This is a story in the Bible, but yet in the history books of Babylon, it is fully recorded about this man becoming like an animal. Let me tell you, people lose their sanity when they allow pride to raise its head in their lives. We lose logic, we lose direction, we lose clarity when pride enters our lives. At the end of those seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, learned my lesson. <laughs> I raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. This is the year where we have prophetically said, this is the year of restoration. Amen? Let me tell you how restoration works. Set God as number one, restoration flows. But put Him as number two, restoration will not flow. As long as you and I are in the number one seat, restoration will not visit our home. Until we lift our eyes to heaven and we say, as for me and my finances, you are number one. As for me and my marriage, you are number one. As for me and my business, you are number one. As for me and every agreement that I sign, it's about you, Jesus, it's about you being honored in every decision and every step I take. Everything is about you, Lord. Then, then restoration will visit our homes. Verse 36. At the same time that my sanity was restored, guess what? My honor and splendor will return to me for the glory of my kingdom. I have learned when we are willing to humble ourselves, what God adds back into our lives. But the more we walk around in pride and arrogance, keep on telling people who we are and are humbling ourselves, we will not be favorably positioned as God would want to position us. He goes on and he says, My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before because I learned to eat humble pie. Turn to someone and say, I think you need a slice of that tonight. <laughs> now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything He does is right and all His ways are just. And those who walk in pride he is able to humble. I am a story that bears witness that when you allow pride to enter your heart, careful, look what happened to me. God knows how to humble the proud. So who's our greatest enemy? Do not look at your husband. Do not look at your wife. Our greatest enemy is not even the devil. Our greatest enemy is ego where it's all about ourselves. Now another story quickly in 2 Kings chapter 5, this phrase, do you know who I am? It actually comes from here. So let's, let's, let's turn to the story together. 2 Kings chapter 5 verse 1, it says, Now Naaman 
was commander of the army of the king of Aram. So in regards to this king, Naaman was the commander in charge. He had power. He had a position. He was respected by the king. It says he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given him victory to Aram. So through who did the Lord give victory to the king Aram? Through Naaman. Because Naaman led the soldiers into battle. Naaman led the soldiers into victory. Naaman came back and he was regarded by the king, respected by the king, gave him the respect and the honor. So surely something happens in your mind when you're not sure how to manage the praise of man. It says he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. And because of that, his wife employed a little girl as a servant. And this little girl came to her one day and said, I think you should tell the master that there is a solution for his leprosy. All he needs to do is go and see the man of God. And if he sees the man of God, he will be healed from his leprosy. Verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped off at the door of Elisha's house. I'm thinking, Naaman, why, why do you have to take all your horses? And why do you have to take all your chariots? Why don't you just get on your donkey and humble yourself and just go and see the house? Why do you have to go with this whole parade? Do you know who I am? Like everyone can see you arriving with all your chariots and with all your horses, all because you want a prayer request. Can you imagine if you come to church on a Sunday with a whole parade of people just saying, do you know who I am? With my prayer request. <laughs> Verse 10. So Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, oh, I love it. Did the man of God come out of his house to meet him? Nah. Elisha stayed in the lounge, maybe reading his newspaper. Maybe he was on Facebook. I don't know what he was doing, but Elisha wasn't going to come out. Because of this was going to be a lesson to Naaman who thought he had become someone too powerful. That when he rocks up with all his chariots and horses, everyone must jump. How many of us feel like that when we go to work, everyone must jump around us? And when we arrive at home, everyone must jump because dad's arrived. Mom's in the house. Jump when I speak. We are leader in the church and suddenly everyone must bow down and say, Whoa, the man with the hour, with the power for that hour. Elisha's told, excuse me, Naaman's at the door. So Elisha stays inside and sends a messenger to go and tell Naaman, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Can you imagine that? This man that's so powerful comes and Elisha just sends a messenger. He's just going to tell him, go, go to the Jordan River and dip himself seven times in it. This, this man is like very angry now. It's like an advert we saw earlier on. Do you know who I am? Verse 11. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that this man of God would surely come out to meet me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand like a magic wand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. But do you know who I am? Just come out and meet me. But he tells me to go and bath in the Jordan River seven times. Wait, am I dirty? Do you know who I am? Verse 14. So Naaman went. He went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. As the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Because he chose to humble himself. And because of that, it attracted healing in his life. I really believe our problem we're not getting the breakthrough we need is not because of the devil restricting it. It's because sometimes of our ego that is in the way. Because we make life personal. We make it all about ourselves. And because of doing that, it restricts the flow of God's blessing. Because of pride. Let's quickly go to Luke chapter 10 verse 17. I love it from here. Again, it's going to get, it's going to get excited now. Turn to someone and say, come on now. Get ready. Get ready. The 72 disciples returned to Jesus with joy and said this to Jesus. Lord, we went out. Remember, you gave us authority to go out and pray for the sick. Well, we went out. We got a great report. Listen to the report. 
Even the demons submit to us. Yeah, in your name. But to us. And then just an afterthought, in your name. So how does Jesus reply? The first thing he says, he doesn't say, oh, well done, guys. You, the, you, 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 guys, you guys are the best. Dad. Well done. No, uh, the first thing that Jesus said in verse 18 of Luke chapter 10, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What a response. They just come back to say, I walked in your power, God. I cast the devils out. I laid hands on the sick. And they got healed. Surely we've arrived. God says, ah, 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 ah. you're making it all about yourself, what you've achieved. Let me tell you about Satan when he was in heaven. See, Satan was in heaven. He was the closest angel to the throne of God. He was in a position of great authority. He led the entire courts of heaven in worship. He was the most beautiful angel. He was perfect in beauty, perfect in wisdom. He was flawless. And yet in that position... Yet in that position, he wanted more. But the Bible says pride entered his being because he looked at God and he said, I want to be like God. I want, I want that position. I want that position. I'm not happy with this position. I want another position. And the Bible says because of pride that entered his being, he was thrown out of heaven and he was disqualified and set apart from functioning in that role. No longer to lead worship. And that's why Jesus' response was, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He was demoted. He was disqualified. Verse 19. Listen, disciples, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Isn't that wonderful? Nothing will harm you. However, everyone say however. Do not rejoice. Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Do not rejoice in that. But rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And sometimes I really do become worried. And God has really spoken to me to say, become careful, son. Because when I operate through you, it's not to glorify you, but it's to glorify me. So careful how you testify, because even in your testifying, you make your testifying all about you and nothing about me. I'm an afterthought in your testimony, because when you tell people about the healing, you say, and I prayed for them. And when I declared it, and when I prayed for them, they got healed. Praise Jesus, afterthought. But let me just tell you that I did it my way. How we flex our muscles in our testimony and we think we're giving God the glory, but we're actually making it all about ourselves. And I want to say when we do that, be careful. You're about to lose your position of influence. You're about to lose your position of impact simply because you're making the moment about yourself. You're rejoicing about what you have accomplished. Forgetting to rejoice that you're only doing it or only operating in it. Because your names are written in heaven. So what Jesus is saying, can you just rather rejoice? What does it mean that your names are written in in the book of heaven? It simply means that you are saved. Rejoice that you are forgiven. Rejoice that you are a child of God. Rejoice that you are written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice over that. Don't rejoice over the fact that the demons listen to you. Let me tell you, the demons are not even listening to you. They're listening to the powerful name of Jesus. And that authority that is in you was given to you by Him. Amen? Lord, help us. Because wow, this is going to get a bit anal now. Matthew 7 verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Which tells me, some people will be disqualified from entering heaven. I can say that. The Bible says this. Then there'll be people who will even read scripture and declare what the Bible says. Just remember the devil quoted scripture to Jesus in the desert. Quoting scripture doesn't get you to heaven. Reading the Bible doesn't even get you and I to heaven. It's that relationship with Jesus and only him that gets us to heaven. Come on now church, we've got to get this right. But Lord, Lord, I went to church. That ain't going to get you to heaven. But Lord, Lord, I paid my tithe. That ain't going to get you to heaven. Lord, Lord. 
Lord, I even pray. I, you can pray as long as you want, unless you have a living relationship with Jesus. You ain't gonna get to heaven. I get this right. Jesus, help us. This is not preaching that people want to hear today. But this is just helping you to help your neighbor. Amen. Verse 22, listen carefully to this. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Lord, Lord, did we not do all these supernatural things? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. I don't understand it. Well, let me say this to you. Everything that they said was past tense. Nothing they said was present tense. They did not say, well, we are currently casting demons out. We are currently prophesying and we are currently doing miraculous things. No, no, no. It was all past tense. We were successful. We were powerful. We were in a position where we did do great things. Yes, the problem is when you did it, you allowed it to get into your head. And you started to rejoice over your prophecy. You rejoiced over the miraculous. You rejoiced over the healing and the deliverance. But you took it all for your glory and for your honor. And you made yourself number one in your testimony. And currently you're not even doing it anymore. Currently God is just an afterthought. And because of your pride. Away from me. You evil doers. Depart from me. Because pride separates Pride excludes. Because I never used to understand that clearly. Because how can God still work through you and then say to you, away from me? They were practicing it presently. They were referring to their past successes. And because of their past successes, they became too powerful in their minds to be doing anything now. And how many people say, no, in the old days I used to do this, 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 this in the church? I used to do this, 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 this. So why don't you do it now? Have we become too big for our boots that we can't serve now? Now we just sit back and just be served? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your neighbor. We've got to get this right. Hallelujah. Pride that comes into our conversations. Most of our arguing, most of our fighting is all about I, me, and myself getting my way in this conversation. Jesus, help us. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 2 to 3 says, Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. Listen carefully. Whoever loves God is known by God. What did we read in the previous scripture? Depart from me, I never knew you. Even though you did at one stage all those powerful things, but then you started to rejoice over what you did. And then you stopped loving me. You so loved your success. You so loved your achievement. You so loved your title and your position that you stopped loving me. Away from me. Because the people I know are the people that love me. So what got in the way? 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Oh wow, wait a minute. So how do I lose my love for God? I lose my love for God when I put my love into the world and no longer towards Him. When I stop loving God, I'm not known by God. Because I'm loving the world. What does the world mean? Verse 16. For everything in the world, what is it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. As soon as you and I make everything about ourselves and we become the number one in every situation, number one has to raise its head in the entire conversation. It's what I come out of this. That's love for the world and how the world operates. And because of that, you will lose your love for God. And when you lose your love for God, you are not known by God. And God says, you allow pride to come into your life. And because of pride, pride will stop you from loving God. Because pride only loves one person. Pride loves me. My ego. 
my pride. I'm in love with myself. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 to 7. I'm going to read a few more scriptures quickly. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. How many of you want to be lifted up to a whole other level? Say, God, restore my life, fix my mess, take me to another level. It comes when you and I humble ourselves at all cost. Luke 14, verse 11 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. How many stories do you read of people that used to be in power? That used to be in a position. Who used to have such great influence and lost it. Because pride entered their being. Proverbs 16 verse 5. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Let me tell you. When you and I allow pride to come out of our lives. We will be punished. We will be punished. Proverbs 16 verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I really believe over the next two year window period. We are going to see mighty men. That was, when I say mighty men, simply because they are in positions of great authority, great influence around the world, even in our own nation, are going to fall and come to destruction. Because God's principles will live itself out. Men are going to fall. Women are going to fall because of... Pride. Pride that disqualifies. Proverbs 6 verse 16 says, There are six things the Lord hates. Seven that are detestable. The very first thing that God hates are haughty eyes. Eyes of pride. It's all about me. God hates it. Proverbs 11 verse 2, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 13 verse 10, Pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Let me tell you, do you know what was really at the root of you and I quarreling with each other? is pride, because neither of us wants to give in. Think about it, when you're quarreling at home, no one wants to give in. Because my way is better. Better than your way. And that's really pride because no one wants to say sorry and no one wants to eat a slice of humble pie. Galatians 6 verse 3 says, If anyone thinks they are something where they are not, they deceive themselves. Romans 12 verse 3, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. How many times do we look in the mirror and you say, Hey beautiful, hey handsome, it's me again. That's right, drop down the mic, it's me. We can do this. How we think about ourselves. Do you know the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1? But mark this. When the Bible says mark this, highlight it. There will be terrible times in the last days. People, number one, the first, the first terrible sign of the last day is not load shedding. It's not the corruption of our economy. Let me tell you what it is. People will be lovers of themselves. People will walk around in love with themselves. Every decision is what can I get out of it? Do you know what I want? Do you know who I am? Even they're just, let me tell you, there is such Christian pride in the church today that we make everything about our Christian faith, about I, me, and myself. Where was it your faith? It's Him in you. Amen? It's Him in me. Less of us. More of Jesus. Sometimes we're in a conversation with people when we walk away. All we hear about is their story where they're the main actor and the main individual. Where's Jesus? The, the little attachment at the end. Our story should be all about Jesus. He is the main. He is the center. He is above all else. Someone says amen. amen. Romans 12 verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do you know how you break your pride? Connect with people you don't want to connect with. Yeah, but do you know what they like? Well, yeah. Maybe it's you sitting on your high horse, judging them in your pride, and you think you're better than them. Since when are you better? Are you, are you better than them? 
I'm not talking about you. This is really just going to help you to help your neighbors. But let me tell you about your neighbors out there. They think they're better than you. So the next time you meet them, just tell them, hey, you're not better than me. Every time you and I think we are better than, when racism creeps in, I am better than that color. I'm better than that gender. I am better than that race. I am better. That's the voice of pride. You're heading for distraction. You're heading for disqualification. Jesus, help us. There's so much judgmentalism in the church and in work and in life today. Everyone walking around judging, criticizing as though I am better than them. And then we even use the language, look at them. Look at them. As soon as you say that, look at them. That means me better. <laughs> Jesus, help us. This is my last sermon. I'm going out in a blaze of glory tonight. So this is my last portion of the Bible. Revelation chapter 3. Everyone say, praise the Lord. It's the Lord's last book of the Bible. I guess it could be his last scripture. Have you ever heard about the lukewarm church? Have you ever heard at some stage in your Christian journey where someone said you should either be hot or cold but don't be lukewarm? Have you ever heard that? Well, now I'm going to unpack what is at the root of a lukewarm heart. Revelation chapter 3. Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea in verse 15. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. What does that mean? I am about to exclude you from me. I am about to separate you from me. I'm about to disqualify our connection. What happened to Isaiah? He was separated. Amen? What happened to King Nebuchadnezzar? He was separated from all his splendor. What happened to those who walked in pride? They were separated. Lord, Lord, but do you know what we've done for you in the past? Depart from me. I'm spitting you out. I'm breaking connection. And it's not load shedding. Come on now. Verse 17, Jesus says to this church. Everyone say church equals Christians. So then we understand this is a message that's supposed to be preached to, to, to Christians. Are you a Christian? You need to hear it tonight. You need to hear it. Don't walk away from this. You need to hear it. Verse 17, Jesus says to this church, You say as a church of believers, hmm, I am rich. Sickness will never come to my house. Hmm, no demon will come to my house. Because do you know who I am. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But you need to know God is for me. I'm the man. Let me just tell you, when you walk in religious pride and make it all about yourself, destruction is coming your way. Humble yourself and make it about Jesus again and you're in a safe place. But you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that in your pride, you are wretched. In your pride, you are pitiful. In your pride, you are poor. In your pride, you are blind. In your pride, you are naked. Verse 20. Here I am, <laughs> Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. At what door does he knock? He's knocking at the door of the church. He's knocking at the door of Christian hearts. I thought he was supposed to be in my heart. I thought he was supposed to be the center in the church. And that's why people come. And Jesus, your pride, your ego has kicked me out the house. Your pride has put me on the outside of the door of your heart. Your pride has put me on the outside of the budget of your life, your time, your resources. Your pride has separated me 
from you. And I'm now standing, knocking on the door of your lives. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And we will restore what has been lost. I'm telling you, there are so many Christians walking around thinking they still got it all together with Jesus. And Jesus is on the outside of their house. So Jesus must fit into our time schedules. Jesus must fit into our patterns. Jesus must fit into our diary. Jesus is like, okay, Lord, I'm giving you one more minute. One more minute to show up now. How about us saying, Jesus, sorry that pride was the dictator. Sorry my ego really got in the way. You know, I'm, I'm actually killing my marriage. It's my ego. In actual fact, I'm pushing my kids away because it's my ego. In actual fact, God, your blessing is not coming upon me. Not because you can't bless, it's because... I've moved you to the outside. And Jesus is saying, let me back in. So I've got my last three screens. Pastor A is back in the house with his points. What are the contributing factors to pride? Number one, when you and I disrespect our position, You're contributing to your pride. Are you called husband? Respect your position. You're called wife? Respect it, don't use it to manipulate. You're called a parent? Don't use it to dictate and to impose yourself upon your children and a whole other generation. They're not going to think like you. They're not going to dress, they will not dress like you. Don't even try. Stop trying to make a miniature of yourself and your children. That's disrespecting the position you have of being a parent. Number two, another contributing factor to pride is when we are not just disrespecting your position, but you're showing off your power. Do you know what I did this week? Can everyone be quiet and please listen? Record it, send us the link, let everyone know. When you and I start showing off, showing off, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven, being disqualified from the courts of heaven because of pride. Number three, another contributing factor to pride is favoring your perspective. I don't care what other people think. I don't care about their opinion. I don't care about their perspective because they're, they're basically wrong. It's my perspective. That's pride. Ladies, please, your recipe might be great, but it's not the best. Humble yourself and improve on it. You can always make your curry a little bit better in a hurry. Number four, another contributing factor to pride is mismanaging your personality. How many people, are, this is just who I am. I don't have to change. You must just change yourself around me and accept me the way I am. Oh my word, that's, that's the voice of pride. Just saying, that's who I am. You just, have to, you just have to lump it. That's who I am. You, ch you chose me, babe. This is who I am. Boom! Live it. What? Hashtag, you make it personal. What are the warning signs of pride? If these signs are in your life tonight before you leave this place, I'm, I'm asking you please to say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Number one, you stop serving others. A sign of pride is you stop serving others. Everyone must phone you rather. I will send a message out once. I will never send it out twice. I will never send it out three times. What you're basically saying is I'm not prepared to serve. I will announce it once. If you don't get it, it's your own problem. That just shows me that your heart's not in it. I will keep serving, I will keep serving, I will keep knocking, I will keep phoning, I will still make my coffee for my husband as much as I hate him, I don't want to divorce him, but right now I want to kill him. But I will make the coffee. I will make him coffee, and I will make him good coffee. Not stinking coffee that the dog has even licked in it. No, 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 I'm going to make him good coffee. Because my pastor said, not my pastor, but the word says, 
when I stop serving, when I stop serving, that's a sign of pride. Number two, another sign of pride is you stop respecting others. How can we curse each other, swear at each other, lie to each other, think that we're better than, and walk away with, I'm just being humble and telling you the truth. That's pride. Number three, another third sign of pride is you stop giving thanks to others. When someone, how many of us, we all, can I, can I just come back to our house? How many of us leave you on a Sunday saying thank you to people that served us? Or do we walk in saying, I deserve it, I, I paid my tithe for the first time. I deserve the benefits. What are you sitting in my chair? Move. It's my chair. Do you know who I am? Two sugars, please. No, no, really. When you and I stop saying thank you to Jesus, stop saying thank you to each other, thanking our wives, thanking our children, thanking our boss for the paycheck, not saying, well, I deserve it because I work for it. Hey, you're disrespecting him already. Pride. Just rather say, I'm going to keep on. I'm going to keep on serving. I'm going to keep on respecting. And I'm going to keep on giving thanks. Amen? No one said amen. That's okay. <laughs> Number four. Warning signs of pride. Another warning sign. You stop encouraging others. No one finds me. No one encourages me. Woe is me. Excuse me, sir. Do you, do you phone anyone and encourage them? Do you, sir? Do you, ma'am? No. Well, I just think you've got a bit of pride, don't you? Why is it that everyone must bless you, encourage you, bow down to you, but you're not willing to lift a finger? Do you know what my gifting is? Do you know what my calling is? Do you know what my talent and my skill is? No, I don't want to know that. You know what I want to know? I want to see your heart. I want to see a heart of humility, a heart that says, what can I do? What can I do? Wake up in the morning, go to your, what do you want, babe? Just, you just tell me, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your genie in a bottle. <laughs> no, pride says, you're the genie in a bottle. You jump when I tell you to jump, because I'm your man. Mm, Jesus, help us. Why? Hashtag, you make it? Everyone says, last screen, last screen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Avoiding disqualification with this element of pride. Number one, do you know how you avoid pride in your life? Build with biblical values. Saturate your mind with what the Bible has to say. Number two, choose godly company and godly counsel, not Mr. and Mrs. Google. Get Holy Spirit filled men and women that love Jesus. Who will come alongside you, not to tell us what we want to hear, but tell us what we need to hear. Number three, hold yourself accountable. Who are you accountable to not to? Who's walking with you and asking you the uncomfortable questions about your sex life? That the pastor did say, everyone woke up now, it's amazing. You use the right words and everyone's awake. But, but seriously, who asks you, how is your sex life? How's your life with your children? Well, we can go with that one. How's your finances? Okay, so are you tithing? Don't judge. No, but are you tithing? Do we exclude God there? Let me tell you what the number one enemy to tithing is. It's pride. Because I will not test God and trust His word. I work for the money. It's my money. And the church was not going to get my money. When was it all about my money? Wasn't it his provision in our lives that we may honor him? I want to, I, I, someone needs to hear it. Tithe this month for the first time correctly. And watch God work in your life. But don't use it as a magic wand. I've done it, Lord. Now show up. Just honor him with every fiber of your being. Hold yourself accountable. I want to tell you what is happening in churches. Oh God, help us 
Christians are swapping their partners with other partners on a Friday and collecting their wife on a Sunday. And then they go to praise Jesus together. Really? You'll be shocked what Christians are doing. And that is why more than ever before, the Word of God has to be preached so that we can become what we need to become in the days that are dark and evil. I'll tell you now, I'm not judging, I'm telling you straight. Pride keeps you from gathering in this place on a regular basis. Not every time. I'm not saying every time. But how many times does pride rears its head? I'm too tired to pray. Or pray in my sleep. Jesus, let's go to dreamland together. We'll talk in dreamland. No, no, no. Let's, let's call it for what it is. It's really pride that stops us from doing the right thing. It's pride that keeps causing us to do the wrong thing. And we feed it. Jesus, help us. And then lastly, praise God. Pastor, you must go on another conference and stay away. <laughs> Number four. Give God the glory always. You want to nip pride in, break its legs, and show pride who's the boss? Give God the glory always. I got promoted. Well, praise God. Maybe in your storytelling, stop talking about yourself, and maybe in the story, change the character to, I know someone who prayed for someone, and this is what happened to that someone. And don't let you be that someone in your story so that Jesus gets the glory and not you and I get the glory. And someone say, Amen. Amen. What am I saying? Don't make it personal. That's part one. Are we ready for part two? No. Let's bow our heads together. Bless you.